Good morning. Um, we're going to take a little tour um, of the Bible, the history of the Bible, and um, we're going to use some of the artifacts that we have from the archives and um, take a little look. So we had to decide on where we're going to start with this, and um, we didn't want to do ancient manuscripts. So we, um, we're going to start in uh, the 4th century with the Latin Vulgate. So the Latin Vulgate was a 4th century translation translated by St. Jerome, and uh, Jerome's Bible was a revision of the uh, Vetus Latina or the Old Latin. Um, this is, it was made up of what we know now as kind of the standard 66 books of the Bible, 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament, and then 14 Apocrypha books. And this also included Jerome's own commentary. So the word Vulgate is Latin for common or accepted, but ironically this Bible found itself decidedly uncommon as uh, language changed, fewer people were speaking Latin, and um, therefore it needed to be translated. Um, and so um, the common people were not um, using this version very much, but the church, however, considered Latin to be a sacred language. Some even believe that Latin is what the angels speak in heaven. So, um, so this new translation met with uh, some resistance, as these things generally do. Um, according to one story, a bishop uh, read Jerome's version of Jonah to his congregation. Uh, in the old Latin version, the word for the vine under which Jonah um, sat was translated gourd or pumpkin. And in Jerome's version, he translated that word ivy. Well, when the bishop read this new wording, the congregation rose in a body and indignantly left the church, vowing never again to listen to the reading of such heresy. So um, it wasn't always well taken. Um, but the time of hostility that usually meets these type, you know, new changes um, began to die down when people began to learn and to appreciate the superior quality of Jerome's work. And so the Latin Vulgate Bible would be used for over a thousand years without any opposition. So this uh, version we have here, it's later. This is a 1743. And it is a version that has the uh, Old Latin and then, oh, this is the Old Latin and then the Latin Vulgate. So it gives a parallel of the two uh, versions of Latin. Okay, so... Um, as I said, for over a century, this is what we had. Um, we're going to move forward to the from the 4th century to the 14th century. And this is when we meet John Wycliffe. Um, Wycliffe was an Oxford professor, scholar, theologian, and he was also a Catholic priest. And he was well known throughout Europe for his opposition to the teaching of the organized church. Part of his defiance was that he believed that people should be able to read the Bible in their own language. And so Wycliffe and some of the other early reformers began to translate and produce the first handwritten manuscripts in English. Um, these English manuscripts were uh, translated uh, out of the Latin Vulgate because that's all they had at the time. They didn't have anything else to work with. and. Um, this idea of having an English Bible was highly contested. Um, English was considered the language of the lower classes. And Wycliffe's Bible was uh, written using a Midland English dialect that was popular around London. So although the people took to this version, the church marked it as heretical and enforced laws that no one could translate the Bible into English or own an English Bible. If you did, you would be burned at the stake. So um, surprisingly, with uh, all of Wycliffe's opposition to the Catholic Church, he remained a priest his whole life, and he um, actually died a peaceful death in 1384. So um, however, 44 years after his death, the Pope was so infuriated by his teachings that he had his, he ordered that uh, Wycliffe's bones be dug up and burned to ashes and thrown into the river. So, um, next we're going to move, th this isn't actually the next one, uh, Kristen, I need the Gutenberg. We're going this way. <laughs> um, so, the next thing we're going to talk about um, is that in, in history happened in the 1450s, and this was the invention of the printing press. Um, the driving force behind the printing press 
Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. I, I was going to show you a, a, an example of Wycliffe's English. So here's a, a translation of John 3.16, which most of us are familiar with. This is the type of language, language that we're talking about, this Midland English dialect. As you can see how that differs from what we have now. Okay, now on to Gutenberg. <laughs> So the um, next big progression was in the 1450s, and it was the invention of the printing press. And um, this was uh, invented by Johann Gutenberg. Um, Gutenberg's press forever changed the availability of the, the Bible. Um, after experimenting and um, finalizing his printing press, Gutenberg and an associate set up shop in Mainz, Germany, and they began to print um, documents. The first things they printed were, um, were a, a poem about judgment. Um, there was a 1448 calendar that was printed, and then also Catholic indulgences. So that's, he kind of started off with that. Um, the Catholic Gutenberg Bible was the first book that was printed with the use of movable type, and it was an edition of the Vulgate. And it was printed with 44 lines per page, so it's sometimes known as the 40, uh, I'm sorry, 42 lines per page. It's sometimes known as the 42-line Bible. Um, Gutenberg's uh, Bibles were surprisingly beautiful being printed on such a monstrous uh, press as that. Um, they were printed in black ink and then hand illuminated. And um, as you can see with this example, this is a facsimile copy of what a Gutenberg um, Bible page looked like. Um, so uh, Guten the story of Gutenberg, unfortunately, has kind of a sad ending. Um, despite being the inventor of this great invention, Gutenberg uh, fell in with some um, corrupt business associates, and he essentially lost everything that he had built. He lost his press. He lost the Bibles that he had printed. And um, he died in, in poverty. Um, he, there's no way he could have ever known what a, an impact his uh, printing press would have had um, on the world, and specifically on the um, Reformation movement that was coming. Um, so right now there's 49 copies of Gutenberg Bibles that are still in existence. Um, 11 of those copies are on vellum, which is on animal skin, and the rest are printed on paper. Um, most of the known copies that are, still exist are incomplete. The closest copy to us is, uh, they actually have a complete copy on paper at the University of Texas at Austin. So um, they, um, and uh, to keep, kind of give you a perspective of how neat that is, the Vatican has an incomplete copy. So, um, so Texas, <laughs> so, um, the Gutenberg Bibles rarely come on the market, and the last one that I could find sold at Christie's in 1987 for $4.9 million. So we probably will not be adding one of those to our collection. <laughs> um, the next, uh, oh, I had some extra pictures here just um, of what the, um, the original would look like. Um, the next uh, thing we're going to look at. Um, beginning in the early 16th century, we begin to see a really concentrated effort to produce the Bible. Um, the printing press had made this process so much more efficient and accurate than hand uh, scription. Several places in, the, places in the world were working on um, the Bible at the same time, the same kind of time frame. In Spain, um, Francisco Jimenez de Cisneros had commissioned a copy of scripture to be produced by the Complutense University of Madrid. And this is known as the Complutensian Polyglot, kind of a mouthful. Um, and Cisneros was the Archbishop of Toledo. He also was the Regent of Spain after Ferdinand, and, um, and he was also a Grand Inquisitioner, so that kind of gives you kind of the time frame of when he looked. So his version has um, five columns. Um, that's why it's called polyglot for five. Um, it includes a Hebrew. You can see it here. Hebrew, the um, Latin Vulgate, uh, Greek Septuagint. We also have the Ar Aramaic Targum and another its own Latin translation. So one of interesting things about this is that um, 
the, uh, in the Old Testament, they strategically placed between the Greek and Hebrew text the Vulgate. And it was said that um, this was the synagogue on one side and the Eastern Church are set like the thieves on this side and that with Jesus, that is the Roman Catholic, in the midst. So um, it's interesting that they set it up that way. And although this was printed in 1514, which makes it the earliest of this type, um, it, uh, it wasn't released until eight years later. So even though it was printed earlier, um, Erasmus's text beat it out on, as, uh, as being published. And that's what we're going to talk about next, um, Erasmus. So, um, so meanwhile, while this was going on in Switzerland, um, the great scholar Erasmus began working on, to correct errors in the Vulgate. Um, so after century, centuries of the Vulgate being hand-scribed, uh, you can imagine that there were a lot of typographical errors in it and transcription errors. So um, Erasmus began to um, use several Greek manuscripts that were housed at Basel, Switzerland, and um, to put together a Greek New Testament. And uh, Erasmus' work was printed in 1516, and it contained two columns. So the Greek text, and then Erasmus's um, translation in Latin on the other side. Um, Erasmus focused attention on just how corrupt and inaccurate the Latin Vulgate had become. And he was showing the importance of going back to the original languages to, to do your transcription from. And so this was the first non-Latin Vulgate text of the scripture to be produced in over a thousand years. And it was also the first ever to come off of a printing press. Unlike other versions, um, Erasmus was not tied to any one um, church. Erasmus, his, um, he felt like his life's work was that he was a true scholar. And so he didn't take sides in the Protestant Catholic debate. Um, preferring just to work on pure scholarship. And so for centuries, Erasmus' text would be accepted as the Greek text and would soon be known as the Texas Receptus or um, Received Text. And if you want to bring me that uh, Greek manuscript. We also have um, in the archives a Greek uh, manuscript, a lexicon, that um, this is the type of material that um, Erasmus could well have been working from. So. Um, and you'll have an opportunity to look a little bit closer. But you can see that, um, you know, this is what, what type of thing he would have been using in his transcription. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we've done Spain, Switzerland, Germany. Now we're going to move over to England. Oh, I'm sorry, we haven't done Germany yet. Now we're going to look at Germany. So meanwhile in Germany, someone else was working on his translation. Um, this, is, this um, of course, is a famed reformer, Martin Luther, and he once said that he hadn't seen a Bible until he was 20 years old. And uh, after another 20 year, years, not only would he have mastered the Bible, but he would have translated the New Testament into German and started working on the Old Testament. So Luther is known for his role in sparking the Reformation by nailing his 95 Theses to the door of Wittenberg Castle which coincidentally um, happened in 1517 today on October the 31st. Um, so following the Diet of Worms in 1521, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles, Charles V signed an edict against Luther, ordering that his writings be burned. And because of this and the attempt of the council to, to martyr Luther, he hid in a town called Eisnach for the next year. And it was while he was here during this time that he began working on one of his major life projects, um, the translation of the New Testament into German. Luther's work was translated from Erasmus's version of the New Testament, and his first draft was completed in 11 weeks. Um, in the 1930s, Luther would go on to publish the entire Bible in German. Okay, now that we've seen Germany, we're going to go to England. <laughs> okay, so meanwhile in England... Um, William Tyndall was also working on his translation. Um, Tyndall was educated at Oxford and Cambridge, and although he was ordained as a priest, his passion was to translate the Bible from its original languages of Greek and Hebrew into English. 
Um, this was not an approved uh, project by the Catholic Church. Um, it was feared that a Bible in the, common, in the language of the common people uh, would encourage the, ref the reform movement that um, Luther had started. So Tyndall decided to pursue the project anyway without permission. And to do this and to evade arrest, he sailed to Germany. In August of 1525, uh, with the financial backing of a wealthy cloth merchant, Tyndall completed a translation of Erasmus' Greek New Testament into English. He printed uh, 6,000 Tyndall New Testaments. And they were smuggled into England in barrels of flour and bolts of cloth. Um, once they got there, they were summarily condemned by the church and burned. So um, it was not, it, they did not want this Bible. Um, as hard as the church tried to destroy these Bibles, um, they continued to be printed. Um, Tyndale is uh, credited as saying that his best customers were English soldiers because they would buy the Bibles to burn them and then he would take the money that they bought them with and print some more. <laughs> so um, these illegal uh, Bibles were, uh, uh, you couldn't even have one in your possession. If you did, you risked death by burning. So as you can imagine, William Tyndale had found himself in a dangerous position and he was a fugitive. Um, he was an outlaw in Antwerp, and there he continued to work on the Old Testament. It was his desire to have the whole Bible, um, but unfortunately, before it could be completed, he was betrayed and arrested. And um, Tyndall was not was tried not simply just for publishing an English Bible, but because of his Luther-like beliefs, he um, they were very unhappy with uh, the. Uh, commentary that he had put in the Bible, the marginal notes, um, and the introductions to the chapters, they revealed his theology. And Tyndall taught salvation through faith, he denied purgatory, and he argued against praying to Mary and the saints. So because of this, he was convicted of heresy and imprisoned uh, north of Brussels, and Tyndall was uh, executed as a heretic. Um, that is a woodprint from Fox's Book of Martyrs. Um, Tyndall's work proved to be crucial in the development of accessible copies of scripture um, in English. Um, he was quoted as saying to a group of clergy, if God spares my life for a few years, I'll see to it that a boy pushing the plow will know more, more of the Bible than you do. So Tyndall was a, also, as we said, a scholar, and he was a true wordsmith. So he was the creator of some of our most recognizable uh, phrases and words that we use uh, in, in the Bible. Uh, he was, his Bible was the first one to use the word Passover and the word peacemaker and um, the brother's keeper. And then he also coined the phrases, the apple of his eye, the signs of the times, and the salt of the earth. Um, this is a Tyndall page uh, leaf. And this is on loan to us from Dr. Barry McCarty, one of our professors. And he, um, when he brought it to me last week, and he, he, I said, wow, it's so much smaller than I expected because I'm used to these big Bibles. And he said, yes, because it was smuggled. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that makes sense. So um, you can see that it, it does look different. And um, Dr. McCarty had, um, was privileged to be able to acquire this leaf. He was also able to hold one of the copies. There are only three copies of the Tyndall Bible. One is in the British Museum, one is at the St. Paul's Cathedral Library, and then one is in Germany. And um, he was able to uh, hold the one that was in St. Paul's Cathedral Library. Oh, I did it again. I have another slide of Tyndall's English of that same verse that you can see, um, John 3.16. So it's getting closer to what we recognize. Um, and then um, this is Dr. McCarty holding uh, the Tyndall Bible and then a picture of the, uh, the library there at St. Paul's Cathedral. So um, the next, um, right after Tyndall's New Testament, a series of versions were produced in rapid succession. And this was partly because of England's break with the Roman Catholic Church in 1534. But it was also that the government, although they were slow to recognize this, they began to recognize that there was a practical value in people having the Bible in their own language that they could understand. 
Um, Miles Coverdale was a, an Augustan friar who converted to Lutheranism. And his translation of the Bible was printed in 1553 in Antwerp. Um, this version was fashioned considerably uh, after Tyndale's Bible. But he also used the Vulgate, uh, Luther's German translation, an Italian translation called the Sante Pagnini, and the 1530 Zurich Bible. So he took uh, from multiple sources to compile, compile a new one. Um, this was the first completed printed edition of the Bible. Um, unlike Tind Tyndall's Bible, Coverdale did not put any uh, marginal notes in his or commentary. Um, this is also the first version to use the word Biblia or Bible. Um, Coverdale also contributed some recognizable phrases uh, to, our, um, to our language, such as the pride of life and the valley of the shadow of death. Um, and despite strong Lutheran influences to which Henry VIII, the King of England at the time, was vigorously opposed, um, the Bible was not banned. And this may be credited in part to the influence of the Queen at the time, who was Anne Boleyn. And she took a keen interest in Coverdale's version and placed one at court to be read. The second English uh, Bible to be translated was translated by a man named John Rogers, and he used the pseudonym Thomas Matthew. So this is known as the Matthew's Bible or the Martyr's Bible. Um, Rogers was associated with both Tyndall and Coverdale, and before Tyndall's martyrdom, he entrusted Rogers with his translated materials, and this included the work that he had done on the Old Testament. So Roger's Bible uh, was approved by Thomas Cranmer and was the first to be sold in England under the approval of law, uh, royal license. Now it wasn't, um, you can just put it down, um, it wasn't uh, approved, uh, authorized by a, a king, uh, the king, but it was approved. And um, the irony of this version is that the new testament portion wasn't a new version at all. It was Tyndall's uh, translation. So 10 years after uh, he was burned at the stake for translating this heretical Bible, it was approved by the same church. And um, sadly, later in his life, Roger suffered the same fate as Tyndall. He was the first pro Protestant leader burned at the stake under the rule of Queen Mary. Uh, and that was in uh, 1555. Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Um, so according to Fox's Book of Martyrs, when William Tyndall was burned at the stake, his last words were, O oh Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Who would have thought that his prayer would be answered in only three years, in a three years time, when Henry VIII of England authorized a Bible in English? Um, this was known as the Great Bible, and it was printed in 1539. It was the first authorized edition of the Bible in English, and it was to be read aloud in the church services in the Church of England. The Bible was prepared by Miles Coverdale, and we'll see Miles Coverdale pop up uh, ever so often um, along the way. He was working under the commission of Lord uh, Thomas Lord Cromwell. There's a picture of him right there. Um, and he was the secretary to Henry VIII. Um, starting with the Great Bible, we begin to see the significant influence of kings and queens of England on the reproduction of the English Bible. Uh, a large portion of the Great Bible was comprised of the Tyndall Bible, and with the objectionable material removed. And um, the, this name, Great Bible, refers to its size. Um, the leaves measured around 15 inches tall by 10 inches wide. And you can see this is a copy, uh, or this isn't a copy, this is a, a great Bible leaf. Um, and so you can see that it's, it's large in size. Um, that is because these were, um, were to be used in the church, and they were chained to the pulpit of the church. Um, they were, these Bibles were carefully produced by the king's printers one page at a time and then were later bound together. So, um, so we commonly refer to this as the Great Bible, but it was also referred to as the Cromwell Bible since Thomas Cromwell directed its publication. And the Whitchurch Bible, which was um, the printer, and also the Change Bible since, as I said, it was chained to church pulpits to prevent um, removal from the church. 
So as, as were the whims of kings in those days, um, two months after the publication of the Great Bible, Thomas Cromwell was thrown into prison. And he was, uh, he was later uh, beheaded uh, in July of 1540. The next uh, one we're going to talk about is the Geneva Bible. And um, the Geneva Bible is a very historically significant translation of the Bible. It was the primary Bible of the 16th century, uh, 16th century English Protestant Protestantism and um, was used by people like William Shakespeare and John Bunyan, the author of um, Pilgrim's Progress. The Geneva Bible was also the version take that was brought to America on the Mayflower and was used by uh, many English dissenters during the time of the English Civil War. Oliver's Cromwell, if you, uh, Oliver Cromwell's soldiers carried a form of this uh, version known as Cromwell Soldier, Cromwell Soldier's Pocket Bible. And we have, hey, we have a copy of this. This is from 1642. This was a, it wasn't a complete Bible. It was a compilation of verses that had to do with uh, war and uh, things that a soldier would, um, would want to have near them in a time of battle. Um, and so they were kept in their breast pocket. And um, this, is a, this is a very rare uh, Bible, uh, maybe only as many as five are still in existence. There's one in the British Museum, so we're very uh, privileged to have a copy of this. Um, so um, once again, politics plays into the history of the Bible. So when Catholic Queen Mary came to the throne um, in England, uh, the Protestants again found themselves in exile. And it was at this time they assembled in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, among that group was a scholar named William Whittingham, and he supervised the translation um, that we know as the Geneva Bible. He was insisted, assisted in this endeavor through the collaboration of other people, including Miles Coverdale. So here we see Coverdale's influence on three different um, translations. One of the reasons that this translation is so significant it was, is because it was the first mechanically printed, mass-produced Bible available to the public. And um, the Bible also came with a variety of study aids. Um, they, it had verse cross-references, cross chapter introductions, maps, tables, woodcut illustrations, and indices. So you could say that the Geneva Bible was the first study Bible. Um, Keep in mind, however, that much of the exhaustive commentary was considered by the clergy as controversial. And this version included the claim that the post Pope was an antichrist. So it was not well received by the Catholic Church. Um, one notable variation of the Geneva Bible is known as the Britches Bible, and that's what this is. This is what we would refer to as a Britches Bible. This, these started appearing in 1579. In the Bridges Bible, Genesis 3-7 reads, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig tree leaves together and made themselves bridges. And so that is why it is called that. Um, in the King James 16-11, that word bridges was changed to aprons. And um, in most of our modern uh, versions, we use, they use words like coverings or loincloths. So. Um, okay, moving on. So uh, again, we see another, uh, another translation that comes with a new queen. So when the, while the Geneva Bible was the people's choice, most of the leaders of the Church of England were dissatisfied with it. There were two reasons. First, it wasn't authorized by the church, and so it was not to be read from the pulpit. And secondly, its Calvinistic notes were sometimes inflammatory, and making it unsuitable to read from the pulpit. Um, the Archbishop Matthew Parker, with the approval of Queen Elizabeth I, set about on a new revision, and his aim was to produce an official Bible that would replace the Geneva. Um, this work was done by nine bishops, and therefore this is known as the Bishop's Bible, and it was first produced in 1568. Um, there was an extensively revised form um, that was al also released in 1572. Um, in the revision, a number of switches were made to the New Testament in the direction of a more ecclesiastical language. But otherwise, um, 
to bring the text more in line with that found in the Geneva Bible in the Old Testament, the Psalms from the Great Bible were printed alongside those in the tr new translations. Um, unfortunately, those proved impossible to see. Um, this version was a loftier version of the Geneva Bible. The language, as we said, was more ecclesiastical. Um, the first edition was an exceptionally large and included 124 full-page illustrations. Um, the second edition and subsequent editions were rather smaller, around the same size as the first printing of the King James Bible, so more along this side, size. And uh, they mostly lacked the illustrations um, that this one did, um, the very first one did. Um, the text lacked m uh, most of the notes and cross-references in the Geneva Bible, which had contained the controversial theology. Um, but they did have some notes that were helpful to people for whom the Bible was just beginning to circulate in their vernacular. Okay. Not to be outdone by the um, Protestants, the Catholic Church began to work on an English Bible as well. So when King, uh, Queen Elizabeth I came to the throne, many Catholics fled England to France. Um, they feared that there would be retribution because of the persecution of Protestants under Mary's reign. So they settled in France and they established a, 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 a college the same year that the Bishop's Bible was published. Um, this college was founded for the express purpose of training priests in the scripture. And um, they wanted to um, train these priests so they could assist in the work of restoring English, England back to the um, Catholic fold. Kind of a counter-reformation movement. Um, so interestingly, the historical view of the church would have seen this type of training completely unnecessary. So they're really kind of changing the way they're thinking. Um, however, because of the proliferation of scripture in English by the Protestants, they felt that they had to do this to um, repudiate the false uh, teaching that they perceived that was going on in England. So this version was translated from the Latin Vulgate and the New Testament portion was published in Reims in 1582, and, the, um, and 30 years later, the Old Testament was um, published. And this is known as the Douay Reims Bible, um, part of it um, being published in Reims and part of it being um, published in Douay. <clears throat> um, the Bible did well in England, but there were some complications with the language that was used. It, um, it employed a, a very Latin vocabulary. And so um, it found that some of it was just unreadable to English readers. So um, they, did, they did later uh, work on making it a little bit more accessible to the common person. So the last one we're, Bible we're gonna look at, um, this is a copy of, um, this is an interesting copy right here because this has the, Bishop's Bible in one column and the Douay Rings in another. So it's a parallel of those two. Um, so this is, um, this has n notes in it. This was produced by or published by Protestant. So in the uh, introduction, it talks about how it's refuting all this evil work done by these horrible priests in, in France. So um, it's a, that's a really interesting version. Um, so we're going to move on to, this is the last one we're going to look at. It's the King James 1611. Um, in 1567, James VI of Scotland became King James I of England. And there was a desire to replace the Bishop's Bible, um, which was the official Bible of the Church of England. And there were a couple of reasons that they wanted to do this. Um, one of them was because the Geneva Bible was still very popular with the people. And as I said before, it wasn't authorized. Um, and uh, the, also the marginal notes in the Geneva Bible were, were causing problems, um, particularly to King James himself because he didn't like them. He felt that this, um, these notes were... Um, undermined the authority of the king. Um, specifically in Exodus, it, the note said that 
um, that it was right for the Hebrew mis midwives to disobey Pharaoh's orders to kill all the male children. And so things like there was a couple other places too where it basically said, well, they were right not to do what the king told them to. So he didn't like that much. And then he was also feeling pressure from the Puritans who at that time were wishing to reform the Church of England. And they felt that both the Geneva and the Bishop's Bibles were inaccurate. So this new Bible was to be the translation to end all translations, and it was for quite a while. Um, the King, of James, uh, King James was a combined effort of 47 biblical scholars and linguists, and they res represented both the Church of, the e Church of England and the Puritans. And there was a set of 15 uh, general rules that were given to the translators of the um, King James Bible. I'm not going to give you all 15, but I am going to touch on a couple of them. Um, the new version was to follow the Bishop's Bible as much as possible because that was the authorized version. And scholars were to make only the changes necessary for accuracy. Um, the translators were free to draw from many other versions um, to find the best way of expressing the thought that was contained in the original language. So if there was, um, if this thought was, was um, translated better in another version, they were able to use that. Um, there were no marginal notes. King James did not want any marginal notes, except for those to clarify a Hebrew or a Greek word, and they did have cross-reference um, verses. Um, and the, the idea was that the Bible was to speak for itself. No one was to tell you what, what, uh, the, transla what the translation meant. Um, there, uh, the translators were also told to re retain the traditional English office terms. And um, instead of substituting terms that many Protestants preferred, so for example, they were used to they were to use priest instead of elder, they were used to use church instead of congregation, and this was um, this was something that the Puritans this was to appease the Puritans. So um, the Bible was pr uh, printed in 1611, and again it was 66 books, um, and the 14 books of the Apocrypha. Um, we have some leaves here um, that are from a King James 1611. There's four of them. And um, the first printing of the King James 1611 contained an interesting variation. There was a typographical error in the book of Ruth. Um, in Ruth 315, um, they, it was printed using the pronoun he to refer to Ruth instead of she. So um, this error was identified in correct corrected, but they had already been printed. So there are 1611 he Bibles and 1611 she Bibles. And so as you can imagine, a he Bible is very um, collectible and prized by collectors. Um, much like the great Bible, they were pulpit Bibles, so they were large in proportion and chained to pulpits of every church in England. Um, the Bible was, like most of these versions, were met with mixed reviews. Um, the Geneva Bible continued to be popular uh, with, with the people. And although the King James was translated in an effort to, to displace all other translations, the Geneva continued to be printed for another 30 years. Um, as mentioned earlier, it was the Geneva Bible and not the King James that many people brought to America. Um, despite its detractors, the King James Version secured its place as the Bible for English-speaking people for over 250 years. And it has long been revered for its beautiful language and poetic flow. Um, the revised version of six, 1769 is still used by many people today. Um, we have on display here um, a complete 1613, which is a, a little bit later edition of the King James um, but this, again, you can see the hardware would have been um, housed in a church or monastery, a uh, non-monastery church, <laughs> and, um, and changed to, uh, to a pulpit or um, something like that. I also have um, the original King James 1611, John 316. So you can see, if you know John 316 from what we refer to as the King James Bible, um, the 1769, you can see how even that has changed from the 1611 that, um, that was uh, published then. But very close to what we, um, what we would recognize. 
So this, um, I've just tried to give you a brief glimpse of the path that the Bible has traveled to get to us. Um, it's a story of uh, perseverance, of boldness, of bravery. Um, in the history of the Bible, we have times of uh, rejoicing and times of weeping. Um, and we can see through the stories that we've heard how God has preserved his word for us. And because of great sacrifices that have been made on our behalf, we now have a Bible that we can hold in our hands that is in our language. And um, I just would like to close with um, a couple of verses from the psalm, from Psalm 12. Uh, psalm 12, 6 and 7 says, And the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them. O oh Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And I thank you for coming today.